All right, man, peace. You know, brothers, every once in a while in life, you come across people, places, things, corporate entities, sports teams, or what have you, who just seem like they can't get it right. Things never seem to go their way. They always seem to get into their own way. They make promises that they can't fulfill, proclamations that never come to fruition. And it's normally because they have very bad practices. In the same way, you come across people, places, things, entities, sports teams, or what have you, businesses, where everything seems to fall into line for them. And it's because they have productive protocols, practices, habits, or what have you, which makes quote unquote luck manifest itself for them. Like for example, when I was a kid, and a lot of people don't understand this unless you go back to the late 80s, early 90s, the New England Patriots, they were viewed as being exhibit A of a dysfunctional franchise. Like it's really amazing how they've been able to create this 180 paradigm shift in how their corporation, how their business enterprise is perceived. And it's because Robert Kraft took over as owner and went about trying to implement a protocol that always revolved around having a coach who understood himself how to maintain balance through repetition and through consistency. And that's the problem that you have right now with the New York Knicks. A lot of people don't grasp that back in the late 60s to early 70s, the New York Knicks were viewed as the San Antonio Spurs or the Golden State Warriors of that era. They were quote unquote light years of every other team. They ran the best offense. They had the smartest coach. They had the smartest players. Guys like Walt Frazier, Bill Bradley, Dave DeBusher, Walt Bellamy, Willis Reed. Later on, they picked up Earl the Pearl Monroe. Oh, and before I forget, they also had a scrappy young player coming off of their bench who would eventually become a legendary coach by the name of Phil Jackson. Point being is this, everything was going well back then, and sometimes I think about that era, especially in juxtaposition to the dysfunctionality that the Knicks constantly are forced to endure today, and I wonder, damn, did Red Holtzman, did, <laughs> did he cast some type of Kabbalistic spell on the franchise to make sure that They would never win a championship again because of the fruitfulness of that time period. And as we know, the Knicks have, they've had little errors. They've had little spells where they were considered a contender for the title. They drafted the great Patrick Ewing in 1985. Of course, people believe that that draft lottery was rigged, as it probably was, for the sake of trying to empower the New York market. At that time, David Stern had the LA Lakers and the Boston Celtics. And you also have Michael Jordan in Chicago. So the last big market that he would have needed to empower would have been the New York market during that time when the league was still trying to build. It was important that you empowered the bigger markets. So Ewing was drafted there. And during his time period, there were three different tenures when the Knicks were considered a possible contender for the world title. In the late 80s, you had the Rick Pitino bomb squad era with Trent Tucker and Mark Jackson and those guys where they were taking a whole bunch of three-point shots. In the early 90s, during the Pat Riley era, the New York Knicks adopted that bruising style where they just tried to out-physical everyone. They had Charles Oakley and Xavier McDaniel, Anthony Mason, John Starks. And then the last real chance that they had to win a championship was that late 90s New York Knicks team, when in 1996, they basically decided to scrap most of the players from that Pat Riley era apart from their core nucleus, which was Patrick Ewing, John Starks, and Charles Oakley. And they brought in Larry Johnson from the Charlotte Hornets, or they traded Anthony Mason away to the Charlotte Hornets for Larry Johnson. For those of you brothers who remember Larry Johnson, he was a very good player, but he was viewed as being a bit of a disappointment because for those of you cats out there who don't know, Larry Johnson was one of the great college basketball players of the last 40 years. His UNLV teams in the late 80s, early, early 90s were dominant, still to this day considered one of the great NCAA championship teams in the history of the sport. They brought in Allen Houston, who had partnered with Grand Hill for a couple of seasons in Detroit before he decided to depart. And yes, they did overpay a bit for him. And they also brought in Chris Childs. For those of you cats out there who remember, Chris Childs made his name the year before the 1996 offseason by being a scrappy point guard with the New Jersey Nets, who used to like to start fights with many of the league's more established stars in the backcourt. He tried to start a fight with Michael Jordan, with Reggie Miller, with Tim Hardaway. Later on in his career, he's known as the guy with two-piece Kobe Bryant, tough guy Kobe, <laughs> who got his jaw rocked by Chris Childs. 
But that team in the 1996-1997 season coached by Jeff Van Gundy, they started off slow. But when they went to the playoffs, they got hot. And to be honest with you, there was a moment in the 1997 playoffs where they looked like the best team in the entire league. But their Achilles heel was their low basketball IQ, and that manifested itself, I believe it was in, was it Game 5 in Miami? When the New York Knicks came off the bench, when P.J. Brown flipped over Charlie Ward, when someone was taking a free throw, it changed the series completely. Miami came back from down three games to one, defeated the New York Knicks, and the Knicks have never really been serious contenders since then. Of course, they, they made that NBA Finals run in 1999, but nobody ever really thought they were going to beat the Spurs, especially without Ewing. They tried to run that fast break style of offense with Sprewell and John Starks and um, Larry Johnson and Allen Houston, but nobody really thought they were going to beat the Spurs. The Spurs were too smart. They had two of the greatest defensive players of all time in their front court at the same time in Tim Duncan and David Robinson. They were not going to beat the Spurs, and they didn't. And then came James Dolan, which is, which is what Knicks fans are still dealing with today. I'm not a Knicks fan, but I know a lot of Knicks fans. I have a lot of Knicks fans in my family, and they're still very upset about the lack of success that the franchise has experienced since James Dolan has taken over. And unfortunately, in professional sports, the pancreatic cancer stage four version of a problem on a professional sports team is having a bad owner. That's pretty much a disease that you, can, you cannot come back from. If you have a bad owner, you're going to stay a bad franchise until that owner sells the team. Now to James Dolan's credit, he seems to have done a lot to change the front office. He's brought in a lot of name guys that players around the NBA respect, but they still look at the Knicks with a suspicious eye. And that brings us to the events of this past July 1st when both Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving decided that they were not going to join the New York Knicks because Kyrie Irving viewed the Brooklyn Nets as being a better alternative than the New York Knicks. And to be quite frank with you, I agree with him. They made the right decision. Not really just because of the logistical differences in how the team and how the teams handle their problems or handle their players between the Knicks and the Nets, but just because the Nets are more of an artsy fartsy team. It's going to be less pressure on Kyrie and KD than had they come to the New York Knicks because the New York Knicks are dealing with 45, 46 years of decrepitude. They really are. And it would have been too much pressure for Kyrie and KD as a two-man unit, at least how I see it. So they made the right decision. Kyrie is a real artsy fartsy Luciferian dude. Kevin Durant seems to be a pupil of his. I'll be dealing with that in another video. So Brooklyn is a much better place for them because Brooklyn is now artsy fartsy. It's nowhere near as gutter as it used to be 20 years ago. So anyway, they're going to talk about it and I'm going to chime in. Sports Center right now. I'm Trevor Scales, and this is one of those updates that Stephen A. might not be a fan of. The Knicks missed out on just about every big name free agent Sunday, but one in particular stings the most. Our Adrian Wojnarowski and Ramona Shelburn are reporting that New York wasn't prepared to offer Kevin Durant the max due to injury concerns. Well, uh, the Knicks team president had this to say regarding their free agency campaign. While we understand that some Knicks fans could be disappointed with tonight's news, we continue to be upbeat and confident in our plans to rebuild the Knicks to compete for championships in the future through the draft, targeted free agents, and continuing to build around our young core, core of young players. And I think that that's the best way to go for the New York Knicks. This season, if the Knicks were to win 34, 35 games, that's a great thing for them. And some of their pickups are going to put them in a position where they should win somewhere around 34 to 35 games. Evidently, one of those targeted free agents was Julius Randle. Woj found out from Randle's agent that he'll join the Knicks on a three-year, $63 million deal. The dude is coming off of a career year, averaging 21-9-3 on 54% shooting. At those are great numbers. 24 years old. As far as everybody else that the Knicks ended up picking up, you're looking at guys like Bobby Porter's on two for 31, Reggie Bullock on two for 21, and Taj Gibson. Bobby, knock your ass out, Porter's. <laughs> <laughs> there's some dudes you know every generation there's a couple of dudes in the league that you know they're not just selling wolf tickets they will try to whoop your ass Bobby Portis is one of those guys in this generation on two 
for 20. That's it for this sports center right now. Let's get you back over to first take. Certainly hope it works out for Nick's brass in the future. The New York headlines fall in free agency from the New York Daily News, the Mecca with a shot of the Parkway Center. No MSG, so disrespectful. And for the New York Post, nothing but nets with pictures, as you can see, of KD and Kyrie. Oh, those are good, but they're wrong. Uh, Stephen A., how bad is this? And I'm being serious, for the Knicks. I don't think that it's that bad for the Knicks. I really don't. Especially with KD having torn his Achilles, the Knicks just seem to have, they just seem to be very snake bitten. And sometimes you, you have to start, as they say, you have to crawl before you can walk. Their franchise is going to have to build up a lot more equity across the league in order for top notch free agents to take them seriously, even when other players turn them down. That's going to be the real litmus test for the New York Knicks. In the years to come, can they show that they operate on a high enough level? So that when a Kevin Durant or a Kawhi Leonard turn them down, they're still able to get players like a Jimmy Butler or what have you, that second tier. This worst day in New York franchise, New York Knicks franchise is worst day. Uh, I'm not quite sure about that, Stephen A. Getting Patrick Ewan, um, whatever controversies, Charles Oakley getting removed from the arena, overpaying Allen Houston by about $25 million. Um, the only reason why you think that Allen Houston was overpaid is because in Game 5 of the 1997 Eastern Conference Semis, the New York Knicks decided to come off that bench. Because I'm telling you, had they faced the Bulls in the 1997 Conference Finals, that would have been a hell of a series. And I would not have been shocked if they were to have beaten the Bulls. I would not have picked them, but I would not have been shocked if they were to have been able to beat them. I don't care what you can do. Trading Nene and Marcus Camby for the remains of Antonio McDyess. That's right. All, all, all of that. All of that. This is... Max has a vice bed. This is the absolute worst day in the history of the New York Knicks franchise. And I'm going to tell you why it's the worst day. It's the worst day for me, too. Because Max Kellerman is absolutely right. The New York Knicks have lost New York. To I disagree with that. I don't think the Knicks have, quote-unquote, lost New York. I think that the city of New York is still a relative open market when it comes to a professional basketball team, you know, just grabbing it and making the quote-unquote fans or viewers follow along. There's still a lot that needs to be seen with the, <laughs> with the Brooklyn Nets, man. I'm not just going to say, okay, they're going to go to the, to the NBA Finals in a couple of years once KD gets healthy. I'm not a believer in that at all. I'll be covering that more in depth in the video that I do on those two. But to me, they don't have a compatible personality or compatible personalities in a locker room for them to be able to work together very well for the long term. Unless Kyrie Irving has greatly matured from his time period with the Boston Celtics. Unless he has learned from the mistakes that he made last season. Kyrie's problem is that when he looks in the mirror, it's like that film Shallow How. When uh, Gwyneth Paltrow was big and fat and overweight and every time Jack Black looked at her because he was put under a spell... He saw a woman who was slim and good looking and so on and so forth. That's the issue that Kyrie has. When he looks in the mirror, he doesn't see a point guard. He sees Kobe Bryant. And in the history of the NBA, a player who has played in that style has never, ever led his team to a championship. Ever. So in order for him to understand what his true greatness is and how to tap into that true greatness, he's going to have to let go of a lot of the prestige that he's, that he's seeking after. And as I've stated in another video or in other videos, the truly great players have always come to understand that in order for them to lift their team, they're going to have to divest a lot of the prestige and acclaim to other players. Michael Jordan didn't win until he helped Scottie Pippen shine more. Isaiah Thomas didn't win until he helped Joe Dumars and Mark Aguirre and Bill Lambeer shine more. His stats had to drop, not go up. Kyrie Irving is a guy whose who's offensive stats when it comes to scoring points, has gone up incrementally. If he really wants to be a winner, his numbers are going to have to come down and he's going to have to empower his teammates and also show a far greater effort on the defensive end. So I'm not convinced with this Brooklyn Nets venture. They needed it because they need to make a splash. The Nets need to make a splash. They made the playoffs this year and nobody gave a shit. Keep in mind, they're at the very bottom of the NBA rankings when it comes to fan attendance. So nobody cares. Once again, Brooklyn is really artsy-fartsy. It's almost like an East Coast version of the Bay Area. That's how liberal they are out there, just in that borough. And people from Brooklyn think that Brooklyn is 
not even its own city. They think that Brooklyn is its own planet. So <laughs> that's perfect for Kyrie and Kevin Durant because they way out there anyway. They are no longer the team, the basketball franchise that represents the city. Here's where it gets really, really worse. To just break down some inside stuff. <clears throat> As Max pointed out, at the time of the Porzingis trade, which he religiously decried. You have to understand my position, Max, is very, very simple. The New York Knicks let me know. Porzingis and his team came in there. They had a four minute, four minute meeting. He wanted out. He wanted to be gone. Um, and if you didn't let him go, it was gonna be problems. And his presence was gonna interfere in free agency. Knowing that that was the reality of your situation, you found yourself in a pinch where you know that free agency is pending, that you have marquee free agents to attract, and you want to make sure that you bring those guys on board. Now, in the aftermath of all of that, now, in fairness to the Knicks, they religiously still maintain that position and that stance. That is what happened with Chris Dathwaz. They say anything else that is said is a flat-out lie. And I believe them because Porzingis is someone who he seems to come across as someone who read too many headlines about himself and how great he was supposed to be or how great he was going to become. We're going to find out a lot about him in Dallas this upcoming season. What has been said by others connected to the Porzingis camp, they never demanded a trade. They never said they wanted out. All they wanted to do was meet with Dolan, but the president, Steve Mills, informed them that this is not what Dolan does. I'm running basketball operations. And why are you concerned with meeting the owner for? You should be concerned with the people in the front office. That should be a tip-off right there that Porzingis and his team thought that they were bigger than they actually were. Why do you need to meet with the owner? Your job is to interact with the general manager in the front office. They wanted to have a meeting with Dolan. They did not want to meet with Steve Mills. And then they found out that they were traded. I don't know what to believe. I'm going to take the Knicks' word for it for a second because I get to a bigger point. We fast forward to yesterday. You lose out on Kyrie. You lose out on Kevin Durant. If you remember during the finals when I was depressed, I came to the afternoon special in Oakland depressed because I said to you, Kyrie and KD are going to Brooklyn after being told months earlier they were going to the New York Knicks, right? And then we find out that. Then yesterday, Max Kellerman, while I'm in the midst of my depression, when it is clear, Woj, Ramona, and everybody else, KD going to Brooklyn. Do you know DeAndre Jordan? You know that name? Yeah. Let me yeah, he's that goofy Negro who used to play center for the L.A. Clippers, who was a good friend of Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. Look, brothers, look, <laughs> once again, I'm not convinced that the Brooklyn Nets are going to be this juggernaut that they're being built up to be with those three players. I'm really not. A lot of it's going to hinge on Kyrie Irving, whose stock has dropped precipitously, especially in the aftermath of his performance as a Boston Celtic the last couple of years, particularly last year when he showed himself to be a toxic element in the locker room. Former Knicks center. Let me tell you about the former Knicks center, who's now a Brooklyn Net, who Kyrie and KD are going to take less than the max for just to ensure he could get his four years, $40 million. Did you know that he's one of KD's best friends? Did you know that him being one of KD's best friends, obviously he's no fan of the Knicks. And why is he not a fan of the Knicks? Because he got acquired by the New York Knicks according to what he's telling people. He got acquired by the New York Knicks and then the New York Knicks decided they didn't want to play him because they wanted to play some younger dudes. He had a problem with that. So you- Right, but why did he have a problem with that for? I'm sure that he understood that he was also going to be used as bait for KD and therefore he should have assumed that his playing time would go up the next season once KD and Kyrie arrived, hypothetically speaking. Most teams, especially teams that have aging veterans, which DeAndre Jordan, if he's not or if he's not considered that as of right now, he's going to soon be considered that. Most aging veterans are told to sit their asses down when they when they're on a team that's 20, 25 games under 500 by February, March. I mean, that's normal protocol. He was friends with KD. You knew you wanted KD. It would behoove you to ingratiate yourself with this guy so he could vouch for you with KD. 
Well, you know, that might be a bit understandable if DeAndre Jordan were to have approached the coach of the Knicks, Fisdale, and said, I want to play, and Fisdale said, no, I'm not going to play you. That might make a little bit more sense because one would think that Fisdale would have done his homework and understood that DeAndre Jordan is one of Kevin Durant's best friends, and you don't want to piss him off. But DeAndre Jordan comes off as one of those guys who David Fisdale said, you're not going to play much here, DeAndre. We want to give a lot of the young guys more time. Um, we're thankful for your presence here, but we're not going to be playing you that much. And DeAndre probably just looked at him and said, okay, and went and sat his ass down on the bench and acted like a good teammate. But then after the season, wants to bitch and complain. That's what I believe happened. I don't think that DeAndre Jordan went to Fisdale and said, but I want to play. And if I don't play, I'm going to be very offended by that. I don't think that he, I don't think that he said that at all. It's just my take on it. Just logic. I'm just saying, like, I'm not telling you, I'm not, that, that part is not inside information. I'm just deducing, logically, I'm deducing. Excuse me, if you my man, and you already at the organization, I'm thinking about coming to, and I'm a superstar that everybody's going to cover, it, and you as an organization want me, wouldn't it be in their best interest to make sure they take care of my boy, so my boy can want me to, to, to come there? I well, should they taking care of him by paying him? They... <laughs> They're writing them checks. That's them taking care of him. Now, once again, if DeAndre Jordan was pissed off about not playing and he made that known, he verbalized that, and they still sat his ass down, then you'll have more of a point. But until I get that type of empirical data substantiated, I can't just roll with that. Less than 20 minutes. That is the situation. So in closing, here's the bottom line. Jay-Z and them reached out. Come on over. Jay-Z reached out. Stephen A. Smith. You mean that dude who owns about point zero 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 one percent of the Brooklyn Nets? That guy? The dude who they used to have sitting in the half court <laughs> with his black magic wife, Beyonce, uh, as, as mascots. Back in the day, they were sitting at half court because Prokhorov was trotting them out like a damn mascot during the games. Okay. Steve. They ain't gonna, they, they try. You, you know, they give him credit. He's gonna be they blocking could, shots Steve, and rolling to the Steve rhythm, Mills, bro. all of those guys, they tried. They were making phone calls, all of this other stuff. But in the end, the biggest point, Molly and Max, I am a black man. <laughs> now, what the hell does that have to do with anything? I mean, come on. This is the type of bullshit I'm talking about with Stephen A. Smith. They're like, Stephen A., do you know what today's date is? First off, I am a black man. <laughs> Okay, what's that guy doing anything? Because today's the day after Thanksgiving. It's Black Friday. <laughs> there is a black man that is the president of basketball operations for the New York Knicks. There is a black man that is the general manager for the New yeah. York Knicks. There is a black man that is the head coach of the New York Knicks. And you didn't even get an interview. This is a devastating day for me personally. Well, Stephen A., do you really think that many of these multi-multi-millionaire athletes are just going to sign somewhere because the front office or the coach is black? The Charlotte Hornets have a black owner, so-called black owner, and they can't sign any, <laughs> any free agents. So I don't think that they're making their evaluations based on that. Now, if you have your organization tight and together, and you also happen to have a so-called black head coach and a so-called black front office, general manager, president, what have you, and they're cool and they have a good reputation, then that's frosting on the cake. But these guys are not thinking on that level, bruh. Nor should they really. I mean, why would you just cast lots in with someone just because of their so-called skin color and you're not quite sure about their proficiency or their professionalism? In matters of business, you have to make sure that people know what they're doing because it's going to reflect on you. Kevin Durant goes to an organization to say, well, you know what? They have a black coach. I'm going to sign with New Orleans because they have a black coach, Alvin Gentry. And the team goes 35 and 47 every year. That's going to hurt his marketability. So there's a lot more to it than just that. And I got to admit to you, as bad as the New York Knicks have been and as disgusted as I have been with them, this is the first day. And mind you, they got better because Julius Randle's a decent player and Bobby Porter's a player, whatever. Yep. But what I'm saying is because the stars went to Brooklyn. To me, it's over. It I is, think the injury over. impacted it. So, if, well, the injury definitely impacted it. 
when Kevin Durant and Klay Thompson went down, that changed everything for everybody. It really did. Another move that certainly hurt Golden State was when the Clippers, when they traded Tobias Harris to the Philadelphia 76ers, because as brothers who've been on my channel for a while know, I've been, I've been at the head of the charge and saying that the Golden State Warriors, because this is back when supposedly Kevin Durant was thinking about going to the LA Clippers. I was saying that they should think about a possible sign and trade of Kevin Durant to the LA Clippers for Tobias Harris. And that would have been a far more suitable replacement for KD than what they have now, that being D'Angelo Russell. So, but you know, that's gonna be a conversation topic for a whole other video. Point being is this, had they made that move or had the Clippers not made the move that they made with the Philadelphia 76ers, it certainly would have it certainly would have put the Golden State Warriors in a better position to maybe get something better back for Durant. I mean, just looking back in hindsight, they probably should have traded KD right after that Draymond incident and tried to trade him to, to the Clippers right then and there for Tobias Harris. KD would have been healthy, then the Nets would have just been even better. He was never going to go to the Knicks. KD at times has seen... No, supposedly KD actually was going to go to the Knicks, Max Kellerman. ...skinned and immature to me, although I notice his prop. Listen, when you're 18 years old, who's not thin-skinned and immature? He's gotten... You, we've seen his maturity publicly, and he's a man now, obviously, and it, it never appeared stupid to me. KD's always seemed sharp, just, and so someone with a brain is... Well, I'm not quite sure if anybody has ever judged KD's intelligence quotient. I don't think that that's really the issue. Intelligence is just the prism through which you attempt to evaluate information. Sometimes you have to be instructed on what type of information that you're receiving. Katie's never been instructed about life. I mean, look at the household that he came out of. He emerged forth from an emotional black matriarchal household. So there's not much wisdom that has ever been imparted unto him for him to actually learn about the whys of things. Women do not understand the whys of things. They're more concerned with the what's, the who's, the where's, so on and so forth. When you start answering the whys of things, now you're dealing in, in the third dimension, heading into the fourth dimension of understanding. And you're not going to, you're not going to get that type of quote-unquote education in a, in a matriarchal household. You're just not. So that's why Kevin Durant comes off as a searcher. He's always searching. He's still looking. He's 30, 31 years old. He's still trying to figure out what life is about. Because he was not imbued with the understanding of how to evaluate life from his youth. No matter how intelligent Max Kellerman or anyone else believes he is or isn't. The Knicks and go, come on, get out of here with that. The, the, the idea that, they, that the Daily News puts Mecca and they, show, and they show Barclays, it's true. It's over for the Garden Mecca. I mean, at least... Barclays is Medina now, at the very least, but the Garden's never been the Mecca. Like, you gotta go and pay your respects from a basketball point of view, not since Clyde Frazier and Willis Reed. I well, the reason why the, the Garden is known as the Mecca is because Michael Jordan was the first person to really put that stamp on that, on that arena after the 55-point game. I'm sure that it was called the Mecca of basketball before then, but he was the one who really like put the official stamp on it after that game when he scored 55 points on uh i believe it was in march of 1995 he called madison square garden the mecca of basketball and that's mostly because of the ambiance of the arena it's really theatrical when you have the floor lit and the audience or the crowd is is in darkness it's much easier to focus on not only the court but also the baskets if you happen to be a shooter so it brings far more drama and theater to the event. And then understanding that you're in New York, which is widely considered the capital of the planet Earth, which is what it is. New York City is the capital of the planet Earth. That's why you have the United Nations here, things of that nature. So that's what makes it, that's what makes Madison Square Garden be held in such quote unquote reverence from a sporting perspective, not just basketball, but also remember that the Ali Frazier fight, the first fight was also fought. In, in Madison Square Garden. So there's a lot to it and why it's venerated in the way that it is. Patrick Ewing and Charles Oakley held it down without a championship, but since then, since Jim Dolan inherited the team from his father, Chuck Dolan, it's been a clown show. It's Jim Dolan's clown show. The way you get top free agents is not simply, let's get the cap space and now everyone will come because it's New York City. 
especially now that there's an option in town. Understand the reason the Knicks have captive fan, they have a yeah. captive audience, is because they've been the only game in town. The Nets were in Jersey. They were in the ABA, and then they were in Jersey. They're in New York now. I thought LeBron and them would have been smart for them to go to Brooklyn instead of Miami originally. Because as hot as Miami is, there's no hotter spot than Brooklyn. Like, it rings bells worldwide, internationally. It's not like baby brother who wants to be in Brooklyn. Not at all. I don't know where people got that idea. And in a well-run franchise, see... Well, Max Kellerman, I have to stop you for a moment. Because you're evaluating Brooklyn from a hip-hop perspective. That's, that's where you're getting that from, to be honest with you. But overall, Brooklyn is, is viewed as being a subsidiary of New York. Now, Brooklyn is known mostly because of how, you know, that name has been propagated across the earth by rappers like Biggie Smalls and Jay-Z. But Brooklyn is still a subsidiary of, of the overall New York City experience. It's just a fact. But that's why I state that Brooklyn is a great locale for Kyrie and Kevin Durant because they are in their own world. And Brooklyn is almost viewed as or... or the energy behind Brooklyn is pushed as being its own planet. It's almost not even viewed as a borough in New York City. The people who live in Brooklyn or who are from Brooklyn want everyone to believe that Brooklyn is its own planet. So that's a very good spot for Katie and Kyrie. For however long, they're still able to maintain their friendship, which I suspect is going to go through some trials and tribulations, particularly once Katie comes back. What you're doing now, Stephen A., is showing some health actually they struck out on the top guys mm -hmm. so they should sign guys not to one-year deals but to two-year deals next year there are no free agents the year after there are so they're not getting a bunch of one-year mercenaries they're getting a bunch of young interesting players who can play to put with an improving nucleus and then in two years maybe they can demonstrate look we're a healthy franchise and now maybe a top free agent will take their money here's the problem well, before you continue, one of the main problems that the, that the Knicks had, and they just really have had a lot of quote-unquote bad luck, but as I stated in my intro, quote-unquote bad luck is really just an offshoot or an after effect of bad practices. Once you're not showing that you're willing to repeat good business practices, quote-unquote bad luck is going to come upon you. So the bad luck came with the Knicks or to the Knicks in a myriad of ways. Number one, Anthony Davis declared that he wanted to leave New Orleans. That's what really messed up the Knicks. Anthony Davis wanted to go to the Lakers, and that's really the only place that he wanted to go. The Knicks thought that they had a chance to possibly trade for Anthony Davis. They never really had a chance. But how it messed up the Knicks is that Adam Silver and the NBA knew that they were going to have to find a way to recompense the New Orleans market for Anthony Davis so flagrantly joining league not only with the LA Lakers but also LeBron James and Rich Paul. He knew that it was an eyesore so he was going to have to re-ingratiate himself with that market by giving them Zion Williamson. Had it not been for Anthony Davis and Anthony Davis stood pat, I promise you that the Knicks would have gotten the number one overall draft pick this year and they would have gotten Zion Williamson who would have been by far the most exciting prospect in the history of the New York Knicks franchise. That's what really hurt them and then on top of that KD tore his Achilles. KD was going to come to the Knicks. KD had Kyrie convinced to come to the Knicks. So they would have had a squad of KD, Kyrie, and Zion. And I think that Kyrie coming off of his experience with the Boston Celtics, I think that he would have treated Zion better than he treated the young players there. And then on top of that, there would have been the Duke connection. And Zion is a player who does not need the basketball. He would have been willing to just rebound and dunk on people. So... All of those events, one after the other after the other, that occurred almost sequentially, conspired to take down the Knicks. But once again, these things happen to franchises that, are, that have been poorly ran for a long period of time. Jim Dolan is immature and thin-skinned. And that's the guy running the show. His ego is such that he had to start spinning it yesterday. Talking. Right, but Max Kellerman, can you find me a, a billionaire who's not egotistical and thin-skinned? I promise you that you're going to have a very difficult time finding one. Well, we didn't want to give KD a long-term deal because of the because of the injury. When whether or not that's wise, and I think it probably is wise for the Knicks because they're not in the same position the Nets are. They're not about to win anything. Neither are the Nets. The Nets were not about to win anything last year. Look, I have no problem with Jim Dolan saying we have no idea how KD's going to look when he comes back. That's the thought process that you have when you're accustomed to things going wrong. So certain people might say, well, 
Don't you think that he should have been more positive, especially with, with the prospects of getting a KD and a Kyrie? Yes, he should have been positive before KD went down. But after KD goes down, you have to look at the bad streak that you've had energy-wise with your franchise and say, you know what, let's scrap that and let's go to another plan. Because we have to show, we have to, we have to take baby steps first. This, will, this would have been a huge step for the Knicks had KD not gotten hurt because I believe they would have gotten both players. But once he goes down, you can't, you can't make that investment in a Kevin Durant when you don't know what he's going to be because with the Knicks' luck, he never would have been right ever again. Look at Amari Stoudemire. They took the chance on him. He had a great first 30 games, 35 games, and he was never the same after his knees just basically collapsed in on one another from a structural perspective. At the point, Dolan really put that out there because he wants to be seen as the choosing one. He wants to be, I had a choice and I made this choice because his ego is so thin and weak that he needs to put that out there. Oh, no, Dolan decided. Dolan didn't decide a damn thing. He Right, but Max Kellerman, if he does not say anything, you're still going to you're still going to land base him anyway because you have a personal issue with him. Rejected by all the top free agents, as usual, in his career, as the miserable failure as the owner of the New York Knicks, miserable competitive failure on the court. He has never, not one time, gotten any top free agent to take a let's, dime let's, of his money right that now. he inherited. Stop. By the way, stop. And let me tell you why I'm stopping. I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying about Dolan because there's no one with sense that can argue about his level of competence as an executive over a basketball franchise. But you're missing something. And what you're missing is that Dolan has been on the record publicly stating, I don't know basketball. I have very little to do with basketball. I'm going to leave it with other people. It dates back to Lenny Wilkins. It dates back to Isaiah Thomas. It dates back to Larry Brown. It dates back to Donnie Walsh and Mike D'Antoni. It dates back to Glenn Grunwald and these boys. It's dated back to Phil Jackson. I can't sit up here and look. And when you look at the names that Stephen A. just listed, those names have been considered the, the great brainiacs of the NBA over the past 20 plus years. Even though people lambaste Isaiah Thomas Isaiah Thomas uh, and his history of player acquisition and drafting is, is stellar. It's exemplary. It really is. I mean, he drafted Tracy McGrady. He drafted Marcus Camby. He drafted um, Damon Stoudemire. He had Chauncey Billups on that, on that, uh, that Toronto Raptors team in 1997. Like, he had a lot of great players that he either drafted or acquired. Isaiah Thomas has always had a great nose for talent. His problem is that he's, you know, he's so hyper competitive that he does not know how, he does not know how to be in a franchise in a coaching capacity or interacting with others for a very long period of time before he rubs them the wrong way. So that was the issue there. Larry Brown, as we all know, he's not going to last anywhere for more than three, four years because he's just he's just a great a asshole. And Lenny Wilkins, Lenny Wilkins has always been that coach that you brought in to get your team good, but he was going to have a hard time taking them to the next level. I believe that he won a championship as coach of the uh, Seattle Supersonics, if I remember correctly. But he was also the coach at Cleveland Cavaliers in the 80s, early 90s of the Atlanta Hawks in the mid to late 90s, and they could never get over the hump. Dolan is... As disgusted as I am with him with the Oakley deal, the pettiness with the fans, the pettiness with the New York Daily News because it contributes to all of that, and just leave it on him. Somebody is making basketball decisions. And what I'm saying is this. At the end of the day, I I'm looking at it from this perspective. Listen, everybody, everybody that's worked under Dolan, all of them are accountable. And Steve Mills, listen, Steve I love Steve Mills. I, I can't sit up here and ignore what you're not doing. Think about this. You trying to tell me that, that, that Dolan's got something to do with DeAndre Jordan? You trying to tell me that Dolan's got something to do with, with, with the roster that's been accumulated? You trying to tell me that if Dolan steps back and it says, Phil Jackson, here's $60 million, and you're running basketball out 
operations. And Steve Mills is your GM and what have you. Yeah, I know. And, and he was the former president of Madison Square Garden. Now he's the president of basketball operations. And then it was Isaiah and everybody else. What I'm saying is, I what do. we what, well, let me say this before Max Kellerman chimes in. I think that what Max Kellerman is, is saying is that it doesn't matter whether James Dolan has anything to do with the, the minutia of the organization. Where it matters is when it's time to make that big acquisition and the Knicks cannot land a big time free agent. Now, if Max wants to blame it on Dolan, you can. I do understand that that's been a problem over the years. I believe that Dolan has tried to step back, but I also believe that you know, some of the, you know, some of the after effect, some of the trail of his previous uh, uh, problems or, or issues or bad decisions, they still leave a residue to this day. And I'm not quite sure how the Knicks resolve that issue when he's the owner. Look at Brooklyn. The fact, again, because listen, the Knicks got better now. It's not like they not they didn't get better. But they won't stay the course because of Nolan. My point to you is is that at some point in time, you know what the mandate is to be in New York. The franchise is worth about five billion. You not can't, for long. You can't get. You can. I I promise you, Max. I swear to you on my career. Let Dolan try to sell a team. I promise you, people will be lined up with no five doubt, billion dollars. No doubt, because they think they can do a better billion. job. Well, sure. five billion because they're worth five billion dollars. I'm just telling you. The fact that the New York Knicks lost out on stars that ain't even thinking about coming. I'm not just looking at Dolan. I'm, I'm just looking, looking at, at Dolan. everybody. Wait, wait. When, I'm Donnie Walsh, everybody. when Donnie Walsh was playing poker with Masai Ujiri, actually, when he was playing poker with Denver, and, and Carmelo said, no, I'm only going to go to the Knicks. He let it know, be known. Who got a call? From whose agent to say, oh, you better make this happen, and cut Donnie Walsh's legs out, and the Knicks time gave up the time, farm. Time. Yes, that was a terrible trade. And I said that at the time. And <laughs> I got into a long conversation with my pops about that because he wanted them to green light that trade. I told him that Carmelo Anthony was overrated, that they were giving away way too much for a player who you already knew was going to sign with the Knicks the next season. Carmelo was desperate to come to the New York area because he needed to jumpstart the career of his D-level actress wife, Lala. And what Carmelo Anthony's team did was try to act as if if the Knicks didn't make that trade, that they were going to go to the Brooklyn Nets. And Carmelo had not shown me at any point in his career that he was a championship-level player who was worth trading all those young assets that, that the Knicks had at the time or who were considered great young assets at the time for him. Now, in the aftermath, the trade pretty much didn't work out for either side because the Knicks never won shit with Carmelo and the players that they traded away like uh, Wilson Chandler and uh, Gallinari and uh, what's their cat name? The little butterball point guard who's now on OKC. None of them did anything anyway. So it didn't really work out on either side. But the Knicks could have waited for Carmelo and, you know, kind of rolled the dice on that. And had they signed Carmelo after that season, they could have had everybody. Well, that 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 that's true. But well, what happened there? What happened there is that there was a deal that took place. You know, in other words, you negotiate this. Why did the New York Knicks overpay in the Allen Houston by 25 million years ago? You, when no one else could give him more than 70, the Knicks gave him 100 million dollars. Why? Because in the business, they make promises. You got handshake deals, and you have to honor it. Otherwise, nobody will ever give right. business. Right. No, no. What I'm saying is, with Carmelo Anthony. That happened a year earlier. Right, so what Donnie Walsh and I was called upon to do was to honor the agreement that had been right. reached. Real, I understand. Real quick. So there's one. The reason I don't blame all the people you mentioned, I only blame Dolan as a miserable failure in terms of the competitive team, is because there's been one constant. The owner of the Knicks for decades now puts a product out there that is a disgrace and an embarrassment right. to New York City. But now there's a choice. Okay. And this town is a Brooklyn Nets town. Got it. Stephen A., we got No, the town is not a Brooklyn Nets town right now. If the Brooklyn Nets were to win the championship in the next couple of seasons, then, you know, of course, they would go through a, a, a period of what you might call a quote-unquote golden age. But no, New York is not a Brooklyn Nets town. Break, I need this answer really quick, but I want to ask you a personal question, if it's okay. Yeah. If you were to have a... Wait a minute, why are you asking him a personal question on a professional show? That sounds like harassment. A baby born today. Would they be a Knicks fan or a Nets fan? How would you raise them? Here's a better question. Molly Karam, if you could get pregnant, supposedly you can't even get pregnant, how would you raise your child? Supposedly you have issues with your quote-unquote vaginal canal, and I'm being 
100% honest when I say that this is according to her. Allegedly, she has a thing. She says endometriosis or something along those lines. I have no idea why Jalen Rose would marry a woman who can't get pregnant unless he knows something about her that we don't know. I'll leave it at that. All you have to do is look at Molly Karen where she stands up and <laughs> there's some rotten in Denmark there. I just find it very interesting that on national television, she would ask Stephen A. Smith a non-professional question like that. I wonder if LeVar Ball would have asked her a question like that, how she would have responded. Before yesterday, it was oh, in the mix. Oh, oh, right. I've lost so much faith in them right now. I'm trying to tell you right now. I've lost so much faith in them. I don't even want to walk past Madison Square Garden. There's no choice in New York anymore. There's one choice. It's the Nets. The Nets. I can't get upset with the Knicks. I mean, even if I was a Knicks fan, I would not be upset just looking at the context through which things did not work out. But the Knicks, they have a, I don't want to say a, a karmic issue. They just have an issue where they're going to have to, you know, put their nose to the grind and, you know, just work things out slowly but surely. But they're, they're heading in the right direction. As long as their scouting gets better, Dolan stays out the way. And over the course of years, they show that they know how to deal with their players, things will start to get better. Because as of right now, I don't think that the Nets are going to be a championship team anyway. Their style of play, I don't think, is going to be conducive to winning a championship. But we'll find out. It depends if, if Kyrie Irving has matured, if he's willing to listen to the coach, if he's going to play better defense, if he's going to empower his teammates, if Kevin Durant is going to come back the same player that he was before he went down. All those things have to happen. Because as of right now, they look like they're going to be the, the eastern version of the Oklahoma City Thunder. But we'll find out. The OKC Thunder back when, of course, Durant and Westbrook were together. So peace.